uh, so thank you to the town clerk and Posniak and all the other town clerks and their staffs. Um, because somehow the Windsor Town Clerk's Office has managed to um, maintain a ton of Revolutionary War era documents, including lists of recruits and uh, all these documents showing supplies that, uh, that the town gave to their enlisted soldiers. Um, we have in our collection something called the Old Documents Project Collection because it's full of old documents. Um, uh, but we have like a hundred documents uh, that are similar to the town clerk stuff with enlistment records for individuals, uh, military orders, and receipts for goods provided by townspeople, um, provisions lists provided to uh, soldiers and their families. Just so much stuff. Um, so that's how we go about the military service. Um, what about personal lives? So um, sometimes that's actually harder, but uh, here again, pension records provide a lot of information, as I mentioned. They talk about their marriages, children, uh, where they live, and if they're in financial distress. And then you have um, your usual suspects of genealogical resources, census, church final records. Um, and then I put random documents and serendipity because those play such a big role um, in this kind of research. I'm going to talk about one guy from Windsor. Um, who in the beginning of the war was called Plymouth Negro in the military records. Uh, he appears regularly from 1777 to 1782, uh, and after that he disappears. Um, uh, another fellow named Plymouth Freeman suddenly appears after that in 1783. Plymouth Freeman has a pension record and uh, descendants and a known history uh, in New York State after the war, um, starting around 1800. But Plymouth, with no surname, is the one that I'm interested in because he's the one from Windsor. Um, what happened to him? Did he change his name to Freeman? Um, and is he the same guy? The New York Freeman. Um, well, here's where uh, serendipity comes in. Um, I was looking for something else entirely. It, it was in our Jirai Barber collection. Uh, he's a tanner from Windsor who lived on Pleasant Street in the early, the late 18th century, early 19th century. Um, and we have I don't know, a couple dozen folders of stuff in this collection, and I just happened to come across this document dated 1799, and it's an agreement between Gerard de Barber and Clement Freeman, uh, where Barber lets Freeman live on his land in Windsor and farm it in exchange for uh, some of the food that he grows. So I was like, this is like a road to the of this, this guy's life here. Um, I connected, I connected Plymouth Pre uh, Negro of Windsor to Plymouth Freeman of New York through this one uh, document. It was amazing. Um, so yes, yeah, serendipity is from the Um All right, so enough about the documents. Let's get into this. Um, at the very start of America's war for independence from Great Britain, uh, African Americans were serving in the Massachusetts militia. This is uh, a lithograph image from uh, the Boston Massacre in 1777, where a free black man in the middle of Christmas attics is um, largely thought to have been the first casualty of the war. Um, despite this bravery, though, soon thereafter, George Washington uh, forbid black men from joining the army. Uh, Washington was an enslaver of dozens or hundreds of human beings himself, so he well knew how enticing it might be uh, for enslaved people to either fight for their own freedom on the American side, or even worse, uh, to uh, suggest that it might be possible to fight on the British side against their American enslavers. Um, but soon the need for troops outweighed uh, those concerns, and black men were finally allowed to enlist in 1777. Ultimately, around 5,000 to 10,000 um, black men served in the Revolutionary War on the American side, um, which is a really big range uh, because it's very hard to make accurate estimates because even though there are a lot of extant military records, um, we don't, they don't, they don't usually uh, indicate the person's race on them. So, but I do think it's important um, to pin down the number because it helps to reveal the contributions of uh, people of African descent in this conflict. Um, so there are a number of ways of counting. Um, some clues that I help us to identify the race of a person based on their name. Um, obviously, there are those enslaved men who don't have surnames, and many of whom were given a surname of Negro in the um, or Indian in the records. Um, 
in those cases, you can be sure that those those people themselves didn't use that surname. Uh, but for the purposes of record keeping, you get Plymouth Negro instead of just plain Plymouth. Um, and I do want to here acknowledge my use of the word Negro. I apologize for using this. I realize it is uncouth, but it's the word that they were the language that they were using at the time. So um, I'll be using the word throughout the presentation when I'm quoting from the records. Um, so for those uh, men with the given surname of Negro, we can clearly tell their race. Um, there were also a lot of uh, conventions for naming enslaved men. Uh, one was a uh, condescending act of giving an enslaved person a classical or Greco-Roman name that ironically emphasizes uh, the opposite of their situation. Uh, so you get names like Prince, Caesar, uh, Cato, and Primus. Those are all very common names for black men in the 18th century. Um, another category for enslaved people uh, was place names. So names like Boston, London, Providence. Um, and another category was African names. Uh, Cuff, Quash, Cujo are all names of, the, are all days of the week. Um, in uh, Niger, Congo, and West African tradition of naming children after the day of being that they were born. So you come across, if you come across any names like those, um, more often than not, it is a black person. Um, however, there were lots of uh, black people with English or biblical names first and last, um, which would make them pretty ind indistinguishable um, from a white person on a piece of paper. Um, which unfortunately also renders them and their service invisible um, in terms of quantifying black participation in the war. Um, what we do know uh, at this point, or now, is that around 450 men from Windsor fought in the Revolutionary War. Um, of those, I have been able to positively identify seven as black using documentary records, and these are their names. John Brister, Edward Plymouth, Orzella Henry Providence, Clinton Cup, and Oliver Mitchell. Um, there are another seven men, at least, whose um, names appear in lists of soldiers, but they are secondary sources, um, and have been unable to either independently verify uh, their participation or disambiguate them from other people with the same name, or they live elsewhere, or any of the above. Um, so, uh, neither of these lists really includes any others with English first and last names whose races are unmarked in all the records who could be black or white or indigenous, we just don't know. So seven men doesn't sound like a lot, but let's put that number into context. Um, there was a population done in 1777 in Windsor uh, when the population was 2, 000, about 2,000 people. Um, out of that, we have maybe 21% of uh, the white population participated in the war, and anywhere from 19 to 37% of the black population uh, participated. Um, and actually, the 1776 census breaks it down even further, uh, the demographics. There were only 14 black men over the age of 20, um, and nine under the age of 20. So it could have been half or all of the adult black male population, which is really striking to me. Um, so, let's see, who were, who were these men? Um, on May 1st, 1777, uh, the Windsor Town Selectmen uh, started an effort to recruit men to enlist in the Continental Army. They offered 30 pounds, which was a considerable sum at the time, maybe something like $6,000 today, according to the internet, um, to any man who enlisted. Apparently, this 30 pounds was only mildly successful in getting uh, people to enlist because they kept the town kept renewing the pledge week after week uh, through June. Um, the first black man to take them up on their offer was John Brister, um, who actually did so at the very first announcement on May 1st. Um, now, who is John Brister? Um, he was already around 39 years old uh, by 1777, so kind of on the older side to be um, enlisting as a private in the army. Um, he was also married already. He had married Lily Scott in Bolton, Connecticut, um, three years earlier. So it stands to reason that he also probably had children uh, by that time, though I'm not sure how many. 
Um, we do know that he was living in Windsor already. Um, the earliest record I found for John Brewster in Windsor comes from a 1773 entry in a account book, again belonging to Jeriah Barber the Tanner on Hudson Street. Um, there's a page, which I'm sure you can all read. Um, it says, uh, Dr. Alexander Wolcott uh, is buying <laughs> soling and healing shoes, which is a great spell. Also, <laughs> um, oh. so uh, Wolcott was paying for John Brister's shoe repair. Um, and I so wish I knew what this meant about their relationship because Dr. Alexander Wolcott was an enslaver himself. He had formerly uh, enslaved a man called uh, Dr. Primus Manumit, um, who unfortunately I don't have time to go into here because he's one of those unconfirmed guys on the list, um, but you should all know who he is. Uh, he's Windsor's first black doctor. Uh, he may have participated in the Red War, but he would have been an old man by then, so that's hard to say. Um, you can check him out on our website. Um, anyway, uh, Dr. Wilka paid for Brisbane's shoes to be fixed, which indicates that the two were friendly. Uh, and, or perhaps Wolcott owed him money because maybe Brister did some work for him and this was his payment. We're not sure. Whatever the reason, this record puts John Brister in Windsor in 1773, four years before he enlisted. Um, two years, uh, sorry, two of Windsor's officers in the military, Captain Abner Pryor and Lieutenant Seth Phelps, led the recruitment effort in 1777. Um, Captain Pryor enlisted at least two other black men uh, around the same time. Uh, Edward, who was enslaved to First Church Reverend David Sherman Rowland uh, at the time, and Plymouth, who also doesn't have a surname, uh, so that implies to me that he was enslaved. Um, but I don't know to him. And uh, you can see this, their names are at the bottom of that list. Reverend David Rowland was at that time 57 years old and only in his second year as pastor at First Church across the street. Uh, so he had a couple of reasons not to serve in the army. Um, instead, he offered his enslaved man, Edward, to serve in his place, which we know from this document in our collection. Um, this is a transcript from that circled area. Then I, the subscriber, did receive an order of the selectmen of Windsor, 30 pounds, on account of my Negro man Edward enlisting into the Continental Army. Uh, so he's certifying that he got Edward's 30 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> um, as I mentioned earlier, many other men of African descent fought in the war, like many other men. Uh, Edward and Plymouth were given the surname of Negro throughout the contemporaneous records. Um, Michelle? Yeah. Is that document with the last one you just showed? Where does that come from? That comes from our collections and our archives downstairs. Okay. But is that, is that like a, a town selected document? Uh, probably. It's probably a receipt for, for uh, proof that he received the money. Yeah. Um, yeah, it says Edward Negro certificate on there. Oh. Um, all right, so so they appear at the end of this list of 26 other white Windsor men, or 26 other men who uh, enlisted with Captain Pryor, uh, who received blankets from the town uh, as a part of what they earned for joining. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Seth Phelps has a similar list. Uh, with the names of 16 Windsor men who enlisted with him, including Providence Negro and Barzell Henry Negro. Uh, again, it's on the list. Um, oh. This is Barzell Henry's enlistment record. Part of the reason I wanted to do this program is because I, got to, I get to throw in all these documents that I didn't have room for in the newsletter. <laughs> so that's this one. Oh, here's the transcript. Uh, Barzilla Henry's name was spelled so many different ways. <laughs> wow. Um, anyway, uh, so going back to the list, oh, going back to the lists, um, they're all they're all at the end of the list. They all receive uh, same payments and blankets from the town. Uh, 
So in many ways, they were, uh, they were treated the same, but in other ways that are hard to qualify, they were still seen as, dif seen as different, uh, perhaps categorized separately from their white counterparts. Um, so these documents answer a lot of questions, um, you know, like did, did enslaved men from Windsor serve in the war? Yes. How early did they serve? 1777, as soon as they could. Um, but in other ways, they bring up more questions. So why are they all at the ends of the list? And if they lived here in 1777, how long had they been here before that? Uh, where did they live? And these documents certainly can't help us answer uh, social questions like, you know, how did they or their white neighbors feel about them joining the army? Why did they join at all? Um, those aren't questions that really are answered in any records. Um, were any of the enslaved men, uh, which probably includes Providence along with Edward and Plymouth, were any of them motivated by, you know, the fledgling new nation's promises that uh, of freedom for all, all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with rights of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Um, certainly their ideals worth fighting for. Was it more personal? Were they individually offered freedom in exchange for their service? There wasn't actually a law that required that, so um, any such offer would have just been an agreement between uh, the enslaved man and his enslaver. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have any records that show that this is what happened, that they were promised freedom or anything. Um, we don't even know who the enslavers of Providence and Plymouth were. Um, were they even enslaved to Windsor people? Uh, I do have a clue as to the answer to that one. Uh, this is another document from our old documents collection. Uh, it says, Shubile Barber of Windsor enlisted into the Continental Service, and same has bought a Negro man and sent him in his place. And so uh, Negro enlisted with me uh, the 15th day of May, Lieutenant Seth Phelps. Um, Providence's military records show that he enlisted on May 15th, and we know from the previous list that he ended up with Seth Phelps, along with Shubile Barber, oddly. So it's possible that, that, that this man here didn't serve at all because Shubile Barber ended up doing the same. I don't know. There could be another Shubile Barber that seems unlikely. Um, maybe they both enlisted, we don't know. Um, regardless, Providence did end up serving. Uh, we don't know why. We also don't know why John Brister and Barzilla Henry, who are the two men with both first and last names in this uh, recruitment effort, uh, why they joined. Had they been free for a long time before this? Um, or were they recently emancipated? Uh, from his appearance in Gerard Barber's account book, I would guess that Brister at least had been free for a while, if not his whole life. Um, do we know anything else about who John Brister was? Yes. Besides knowing he was married, we also know that he could read and write. Of the dozens of Revolutionary War documents in the town clerk's office, one is in John Brister's handwriting. This one. Um, he wrote to the Windsor town clerk, Henry Allen, uh, from Camp Orangetown, New York, in 1780. It says, Sir, please to let my wife, Lily Brister, have one pound, ten shillings money, and this order shall be your security for the same from your humble servant, John Brister. Uh, so, that's his signature. That's wrong, right? Well, okay. um, it's got this funny S. This, that's actually an S. Uh, that's just how they wrote S's back then. It's very confusing. Um, so, anyway, we know he's literate. We also know that he had at least one son by the time he entered service. Uh, this is another document from the town clerk's office, one of the many lists of sundries or uh, payments of food and other goods given to families of soldiers. So this is sundries provided to John Brister's family. It includes uh, two pair of women's shoes and one pair for his boy. So clearly that's his son. Um, I don't know if the other, if his wife got a lot of shoes or if he had a daughter too. Uh, and I wonder if George Barber made these shoes. So um, that is, that's John Brister. Um, for the rest of the guys, I couldn't really find 
Edward, Plymouth, or Providence among those who got sundries from the town, but maybe that makes sense. Um, I did see Barzilla Henry. Oops. Barzilla Henry, again, <laughs> different spelling for his name. And Samson Cuff, who I will I mentioned before, and I'll talk about him later. Uh, but their records didn't indicate any family, so maybe they were single men for the duration of their service. Um, beyond these things here, unfortunately, we really just don't know that much more about their lives in Windsor. Um, we do know about their activity in the military, though, because uh, from their, their war muster rolls, amongst other records. Uh, and because we know from the muster rolls what regiments they served in, uh, we can trace the activities of those regiments through other sources and find out where they were at a given time. Um, all of these guys ended up serving in the same regiments with one another uh, and with other white Windsorites. Uh, Barzilla, Barzilla Henry in Providence and Shubaya Barber all mustered into the 4th Connecticut Regiment under Captain John Durkee and Colonel John Harmon. Um, John Brister, Plymouth, and Edward, actually that says Ned there. Um, likewise, they stayed together in Captain Abner Pryor's company of the 5th Battalion, command, commanded by Colonel Philip Bradley. I'm only mentioning all these names in case there are some really red war buffs in the audience. And it's names mean something to you. Um, so, Brister, Plymouth, and Edward served along another black man called uh, Prince Negro. I haven't been able to determine where he's from. There's, there's somebody named Prince in Windsor, could be the same guy, I don't know. Um, oh, along with many other white Windsorites. All the guys in yellow are from Windsor. They're all in the same company. Um, and the red ones are the African Americans. Um, some of the white Windsor neighbors in the 5th Regiment here included Daniel Bissell, who is a future spy for George Washington and one of the first three winners of the Purple Heart Award. Let's see. Daniel Bissell. Yes, funny S again, Bissell. Um, and Sherman Rowland. Sherman Rowland was uh, the son of First Church Reverend David Sherman Rowland, also known as Edward's Enslaver. Is that awkward? <laughs> uh, would either have felt animosity towards the other? We can only speculate. Um, would Edward have been uncomfortable in the presence of someone? Uh, whose father legally owned him and controlled his every move outside of the military? Did Sherman feel as though he was serving with someone uh, who was beneath him? It's possible that the two were friendly, um, especially after they had served together for a while. They may have been the same ages. Uh, they may have grown up together. It's possible they played with each other's children. Um, perhaps the truth is somewhere in between. It's, it's really impossible to know what relationships were uh, like generally among these recruits um, or what the community atmosphere was like on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, across the New England regiments uh, of the Revolutionary War, most or all of them were integrated, um, but black men usually only made up a small proportion of, of each uh, company, just as they would have you know, in a small or medium New England town, like Windsor. Uh, what we know is that uh, black soldiers were never officers, but they didn't perform the same duties and tasks. They wore the same uniforms, uh, fought in the same battles, received the same pay and benefits, and endured the same casualties as their white counterparts. So we have to assume that discrimination did occur uh, on a personal level, um, because slavery was still the law of the land in the North, many places in the North. Uh, but there was very little difference in how the military treated them once in service. Um, as I mentioned earlier, by following the regiments that we know our Windsor guys were in, we can track where they would have been at, at a given moment in, during the war. So John Brister, Plymouth, and the rest of the 5th Connecticut Regiment were among the units who spent the winter of 1777 to 78 uh, in, with George Washington at Valley Forge. Um, they, this included more than 700 African Americans. They also both later fought at the Battle of Monmouth, which is uh, illustrated here. In fact, uh, Plymouth in particular was a participant to, or eyewitness to, 
a participant in or eyewitness to many key events uh, of the war. Because he came to serve as a waiter for General Jedediah Huntington uh, on and off for over four years. Uh, waiters were what they called like personal servants for officers, and both black and white men served in this role. Um, in his capacity as a waiter, Plymouth would have accompanied General Huntington wherever he went, including uh, when the general was assigned to the court martial for General Charles Lee and to the trial of British Major John Andre. Here is a list of where John Brister, a uh, uh, select list of where John Brister served throughout his six years in the war. As you can see, he was present at a bunch of major battles and encampments uh, that people would recognize. Saratoga, Termitown, Gullet Forge, Monmouth, Reading, um, Yorktown, Dobbsbury. Uh, Brister also seems to have spent most of the war serving in the same company with at least one other black Windsorite. He was with Plymouth and Edward at the beginning, and later served with Samson Cuff in the 2nd Connecticut Regiment. Um, I haven't talked about Samson Cuff very much yet because he took a slightly different path from the first group of recruits um, during his three years of service. Um, he didn't enter the war until 1781, and these other guys had been in it for four years already. Uh, Samson having a surname, Cuff, and implies that he was free by the time he enlisted, but his biblical first name and African origin surname suggest he was likely he was likely born enslaved to an enslaved father with the first name of Cuff. Um, born around 1758, he was a bit younger than the others we've been discussing, uh, but he enlisted from winter in 1781, as you can see from here, this enlistment certificate. Uh, and joined the second company of Connecticut's 4th Regiment, which was one of the very few all-black units in the war. Mm. Um, for about a year, he would have been, uh, which would have been plenty of time to form close bonds. He was surrounded not by uh, his neighbors from Windsor, from home, but by a few dozen fellow soldiers who looked like him. I imagine this must have been a source of pride for everyone in the second company. Um, though not much has been written about the second company on their own, they aligned with a, uh, another Connecticut regiment and a Rhode Island regiment in 1781. The picture I've shown of this, this group here, that's uh, reenactors from the 1st Rhode Island regiment, an all black regiment. Um, so this company merged with them for a little while. And a French officer who observed this combined unit noted that, quote, three quarters of the Rhode Island Regiment consists of Negroes, and that regiment is the most neatly dressed, the best under arms, and the most precise in its maneuver, end quote. Um, towards the end of the war in 1783, after further regimental shuffling, reshuffling, Samson Cuff and John Brister found themselves together in the 3rd Company of Connecticut's 2nd Regiment, uh, along with other fellow white Windsorites like Sherman Rowland. Uh, by that point, Brister and Rowland had served in the same company for a solid six years. Um, I wonder if such prolonged brotherhood in arms led them to become friends, if not equals. Uh, Rowland remained the son of the enslaver of their former comrade Edward, uh, whose story tragically ended a few years earlier. Um, at some point before 1778, Sherman Rowland's father, Reverend David Rowland, sold Edward to Captain Pryor, who was presumably the same Captain Abner Pryor who enlisted him the year before. Uh, this is a record of that sale from our archives. Uh, it took it that he was returned for part of the quota for the town of Windsor. Uh, the last we see of Edward is a simple notation on Captain Pryor's muster roll from July 1778. It says Edward Negro died 15th July 1778. So even if Reverend Rowland or Captain Pryor pledged to manumit Edward after his service, uh, he sadly never got a chance to experience that life of freedom. Um, on the 
On the other hand, oh, and you can see Plymouth is being a waiter to a general there. On the other hand, Plymouth almost certainly did earn his freedom, uh, his emancipation. I had a temporary brick wall in piecing together his story because, um, as I mentioned, Plymouth of Windsor disappears after 1782, and Plymouth Freeman appears in 1783. Uh, and before January 1783, there was no Plymouth Freeman. Um, it's possible that there there are there are other men named Plymouth, but it's it's a relatively uncommon uh, name. So I'm hopeful that Windsor Plymouth uh, marked his emancipation by taking out the surname Freeman. But for our purposes, I'm going to assume it's the same guy. Uh, Plymouth Freeman and John Brister both served for six years of the war, which earned them the Badge of Merit, also known as the Badge of Distinction. Um, their discharge papers, as you can see here, are signed by George Washington. Mm. Um, so, what did Plymouth do with the freedom that he earned? What did he and the rest of these guys do after the war? Um, well, there is a 16-year gap in the records between when Plymouth mustered out at West Point in 1783 to when Plymouth Freeman made a deal with Gerard Barber to form his land in Windsor in 1799. Uh, but it stands to reason that if he lived in Windsor before the war and then he lived here again 16 years later, then he probably lived here, I hope, I think, all that time in between. Um, I don't know what he was doing, but seem to be doing some farming at least. Um, there are 36 free people of color in the 1790 Windsor census. Five of them were John Brister and his family. They were the only all-black household enumerated in town for that census year. Uh, so Plymouth could very well have been one of the 31 other free people of color uh, who lived in white households. Um, Unfortunately, the 1790 census just lists heads of households and then counts the number of the people in the house after that, so we don't know for sure where, where anybody lived except for the white men at the head of the household. Mm -hmm. um, and in any case, in 1793, Plymouth Freeman received 100 acres of bounty land from the United States government as payment for his Revolutionary War service. That land was probably somewhere in the great unknown of Ohio which is a bit far from home. So um, very shortly after he fulfilled his agreement with Jirajah Barber, um, instead of moving to Ohio, he sold the bounty land, which many of these bounty land recipients did. He sold that. Um, and instead moved not quite so far, but to New York, to Casanova, New York, which is um, about 20 miles outside of Syracuse. Um, Plymouth Freeman got married, had at least one son, and lived a regular life, probably farming. He may have learned to read um, because there were notices in the local paper, newspaper in the 1800s listing Plymouth Freeman as one of the people who had mail to pick up at the post office. Um, finally, he died in 1829 at the age of 87. So uh, last year, the local Daughters of the American Revolution chapter near Casanova honored Plymouth Freeman with this historic marker, uh, erected near where he lived in town. At the marker's unveiling ceremony, uh, the past DAR chapter regent said this in her remarks, quote, Plymouth's role, like the role of thousands of others, was critical in obtaining our freedom. We can be certain that Plymouth knew the deep, innate desire for freedom, more so than any of us can imagine. He served faithfully and honorably, earning the respect and admiration and appreciation of his commanding officers. This is a fact, and for this we will be forever grateful to Plymouth Freeman." End quote. So uh, Plymouth's journey took him to New York. What happened to the rest of the Windsor Black Patriots? Uh, well, like Plymouth, Providence also appears to have taken on a surname during the war, but he was even harder to follow than, than, than Plymouth. Uh, Providence and Barzilla Henry enlisted at the same time under Seth uh, Phelps. Barzilla Henry shows up on Seth Phelps' war rolls, but Providence Negro does not. Instead, Providence Buckley is there. Um, so I think it would be 
a big coincidence if two different providences ended up in the same company. It's not like it was Jack. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it, providence is just not that common of a name. So I'm assuming that Providence of Windsor became Providence Buckley. Uh, but while Providence Buckley is in these war roles, he doesn't have a pension record, but a man named Providence Freeman does have a pension record, and he doesn't have the Heath Mustard roll uh, records. Uh, and the enlistment dates match, so I think that Providence of Windsor took on the name surname of Buckley during the war and changed it to Freeman after the war, um, which immediately begs the question of where did the surname Buckley come from? Uh, there weren't any Buckleys in Windsor that I'm uh, aware of. Um, so did Providence live in, in another town before coming here to, to enlist? Maybe. I may have an answer to that. Uh, Providence Freeman's pension record includes a statement from a man who knew Providence when he was a boy in New London, Connecticut. Um, so remember that these pension records include narratives and life details uh, that exist nowhere else. They are gold. Uh, this New Londoner recollected that Providence was enslaved to the Hurlbut family in that town. After some digging, I found an estate inventory for Joseph Hurlbut Jr. from 1774. Uh, if you don't know, an estate inventory is a listing of all of a person's possessions at the time of their death, and that would have included human beings considered to be property. Um, so this inventory lists a Negro servant named Providence, valued at 35 pounds, as well as a Negro woman servant named Sleeler, valued at 13 pounds. Um, by 1774, Providence Freeman would have been around 34 years old. That was, this was three years before Pro Providence Negro appeared on the blankets recipients list in Windsor. Um, so you may recall that uh, Providence was also the person that I suspected was named slave man, uh, bought by Shu by a barber to serve in his place. You can see that their enlistment dates match May 15, 1777. Um, so, after Providence appeared in the Pearlba estate inventory, did the estate executor sell him to someone mainly named Buckley? <laughs> and three years later, did that person sell him to Shubael Barber? I realize that's a lot of speculation. The pieces fit together. That's how I want them to. <laughs> um, anyway, after the war, uh, Providence Freeman moves back to New London, uh, New London County at some point, suddenly in Colchester. Uh, in 1806, when he is 66 years old, he marries a woman, 48 years in junior, a Zumba Rand, and uh, together they have one or two daughters. When the 1818 Pension Act is passed, Providence applies. Um, as part of the application to prove that he is in financial need, he writes, or dictates, um, a letter explaining that he has, quote, been a laborer, but am wholly unable to work by reason of a very bad rupture in my body and other bodily infirmities. I mean, he was 78. Um, he also declares that he owns only two small chairs, a kettle, three knives and forks, a poor table, and a skillet. <laughs> so um, he does receive his pension. Um, and after his death uh, in 1824, at the age of 84, his wife, Azuba, received his pension. Um, I don't have as much detail about the rest of the men, but I can say that um, John Brister, Samson Huff, and Marcel Henry all returned to live in Windsor after the war. As I mentioned, John Brister is the only uh, black head of a household in uh, the 1790 census. Um, you can see approximately where he lived um, on this map from 1798 uh, on Windsor Avenue, right about where Island Road is now, but that road didn't exist in 1798. Um, he and his wife Lily went on to have nine children, uh, but by 1800 they had left Windsor for Bark Hampstead. He lived in Litchfield County for the next 20 or so years, uh, during which time he applied for a pension uh, because he had also become in need, in, in need of financial assistance. He passed away in Hartford in 1824, around age 86. Wow. Samson Cuff 
and Barzilla Henry, I said, also lived in Windsor after the war. Cuff left for Otis, Massachusetts eventually, and also died in his 80s, in 1842, around age 83. Uh, the last location I found for Barzilla Henry comes from 1788, when he won a court case in Windsor. Um, like Plymouth Freeman, he also got 100 acres of bounty land uh, from the government, and like Plymouth, he sold that land in 1800, but I haven't found him anywhere else, so I don't know what happened to him. Um, there's one other black patriot I mentioned way at the beginning of my talk that I neglected to mention again, uh, and that is Oliver Mitchell. Um, because his story didn't fit as neatly uh, into the narrative of the other six guys. Um, because that service was entirely different. Uh, but his experience gives us an insight into what was happening in Windsor during the war. Um, the reason we know so much about his situation during the war is because he himself wrote about it in his pension application. We learn so much about him from the letters that he and his friends and neighbors wrote on his behalf. Um, Oliver Mitchell was literate. Um, you can see some of his signatures from various documents here. So some of what we know comes from his own words. Um, I'm not showing images of the pension records because if you thought any of those other documents were hard to read for pension <laughs> records that are like scribbles, they're impossible. And it was just looked dumb up there. Um, so Oliver Mitchell was much younger than all the others I've talked about. Um, he tells us himself in his pension letter that he was born in Simsbury in 1762 and moved with his family to Windsor when he was two, which suggests to me that he has been free for most or all of his life. Um, he was only 16 years old in 1778 uh, when he joined the Continental Guard stationed at Windsor. Uh, Mitchell reported that Windsor's Colonel Roger Newberry was authorized to raise a new guard um, which was tasked with protecting and defending the hospital and army stores kept in town. Um, apparently the army had stored a large amount of supplies, uh, medical and other supplies in Windsor, but there was no single building large enough here to store everything, so they dispersed the supplies amongst uh, several buildings in town, which I imagine were probably just large houses. Um, maybe churches are the only buildings that were big enough. Um, so Oliver Mitchell was assigned as a sentry for these storehouses. Um, this Continental Guard, or Hospital Guard, as it was also called, um, consisted of 12 men and an officer. Uh, and Mitchell served in this role for more than a year and a half. Um, I imagine that all the sundry supplies that John Brister's family were getting were also stored in these types of locations and monitored by Mitchell and the rest of the guard. Um, the rest of the guard, also, the ones that I've been able to look into, also seem to be younger guys. So I don't know if they were like too young to serve in combat units, um, but for whatever reason, there's there's other teenagers who are in this guard. Are they from Windsor as well? Yes. Yeah. Um, besides the nature of his service, Oliver Oliver Mitchell is an exception in another way. Uh, we actually know a lot about him um, after the war because he lived for the rest of his life in Windsor and East Windsor. And moreover, he uh, lived among and worked with lots of white families whose records and other materials we have in our archives. Um, so he shows up all over the place in our collections and church records and landings and personal recollections. Um, Oliver Mitchell uh, married his wife Rachel around 1784 when he was 22 years old. They had five children together, but sadly Rachel died in 1796, possibly while having uh, their youngest child who also died that year. Uh, Mitchell helpfully wrote down the list of all his children's birth dates, which was included in his pension record as well. And that's what this is. Um, you all don't know how hard this is. Maybe you do. Maybe you do. Um, so the year after his wife Rachel died, uh, Oliver got married a second time to a white woman named Anna Wright. Anna tells us in her own words uh, that they got married by Magistrate Josiah B uh, Bissell, Esquire, in Bissell's house. Um, that marriage was never documented in town records, but Anna and their neighbors affirmed the fact in their statements that helped Oliver's pension record transfer to Anna after he died. <laughs> 
Uh, Oliver Mitchell was one of the first black homeowners in Windsor, first buying property in 1797 on the banks of the Connecticut River near the Bissell Ferry Road. Uh, this location makes sense because he made a living making boats and transporting goods via his own boat. Um, in an account book in our collections uh, belonging to Levi Hayden, who's a white man from the Hayden family that gives the Hayden Station neighborhood his name, uh, we see that Oliver bought things like pork and cider uh, and salt and brandy from Hayden. That's all this stuff on this side. And on this side is what, how he paid. And it says um, he paid by boating bricks and other goods for him once as far as Seabrook. Um, this is in the early 1800s, 1804. You can see that there. Uh, Levi Hayden's son, the, this account book is Levi Hayden's. Levi Hayden's son, Jabez Hayden, became a Windsor historian. Uh, and he recalled Mitchell in his book, Historical, Historical Sketches. Um, he remembered being a boy and calling at Oliver Mitchell's house uh, to ask whether the ice was safe to cross the Connecticut River. Uh, Javis Hayden is also the source for how we know how uh, Oliver Mitchell died. He recounted that Mitchell had gone to Hartford, quote, in his rowboat to draw his pension. After collecting his pension, he started his return trip. When he got about eight miles from home, rowing against the current, his oars ceased to ply. The boat drifted to shore. Our friend, Oliver Mitchell, was dead, end quote. Uh, so when he died, Oliver Mitchell owned a spyglass and a silver watch, which not many people, black or white, uh, owned at the time. His descendants continued to live in Windsor for multiple generations. Uh, so those are just some of the stories of some of the black men of Windsor who served in the Revolutionary War. Um, obviously, there's so much more we don't know because there's only so much that we can infer from uh, the scant records that exist. Um, my biggest remaining questions are not about the factual circumstances of their lives, but the more intangible things, their personalities, their thoughts and feelings and motivations um, that each one had about being a part of the founding of this country in this way. Uh, the Revolutionary War was about independence, uh, but black soldiers were fighting for freedom in a more fundamental way than the average white soldier in the Continental Army. Uh, for men like Plymouth, Providence, and Edward of Windsor and the thousands of other enslaved soldiers like them, uh, what was at stake was no less than personal autonomy, uh, the ability to determine their own paths. Uh, these glimpses into their lives and the lives of John Brister, Barzilla Henry, Samson Cuff, and Oliver Mitchell only begin to tell their stories. So much more detective work is needed uh, to fully illuminate who they were as people, uh, as well as who all the other black Revolutionary War patriots were, who we still don't know, uh, from Windsor and beyond. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> I just have a comment. I just got a glimpse of the extraordinary amount of material he must have sifted through. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, like two, two yes. years worth of work. Wow. 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 Impressive. Amazing. Yeah. Um, first, I think all your inferences are from what I understand are right on. Um, but just, just an observation across the river in South Windsor, we, I'm continuously surprised, it sounds like you've seen a lot of the same thing, where there were free black families owning property and living alongside, oh yeah, in, within the community of, of enslaved people. And yes, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by what that means about enslavement in Connecticut during that time, as opposed to other places and even other places in New England. So, I I just find that that piece fascinating. To yeah. your points about what it meant to these different men who served and why they served and how, what that was like when they were fighting alongside white men, 
it, it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't a big town. They all they, they all yeah. must have known each other. They were all neighbors. They all lived along, <laughs> like, what is Room 159 now. Um, there were not enough, I think, Black families at the time to have any neighborhoods of, of, of Black families. So everybody was, was dispersed. It, 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 yeah, it's, it's fascinating to think about just the personal relationships and interpersonal relationships that must have yeah. existed uh, and how they might have changed as people fought alongside each other for so long or 50 years later. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Quick one, Michelle. Did, I know that you know the Lexington alarm. There was some, uh, quite a few Connecticut, like four thousand ultimately went up to the Boston area. Were and that was before Washington came in, after Bunker Hill in seventeen June seventeen seventy five. And that's what he said. I don't want the blacks. I think that's what. It, so do you know if any of the uh, the, the black Windsorites had, had gone earlier, or because you you have seventy 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 for the yeah, I don't know. There, there aren't any that I know of. I mean, we there are records of a bunch of white men from Windsor who, who were in the Lexington alarm, like Nathaniel Hayden, whose house is still standing on the Hayden Station Road. Um, but I haven't found names of any any black men. But again, like if 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 somebody has like an English name, a first and last name, I wouldn't know. Um, so you can you just can't tell the difference. Okay.